Good, no echo. That's fantastic. So let's start this. How long did that take me? Three minutes. It only took me three minutes, you guys, to um, learn how to do technology. So we have the inspector here, and uh, I have him here because the, we kind of have a theme for this video, even though it's going gonna, it's gonna to go uh, in whatever direction you guys want to take it based on your questions. Um, and I have a few questions from Patreon and such like that that are, that are different, but I want to talk about feeding today. And the inspector, as many of you know, um, uh, was on a food strike for, gosh, I should have looked it up. I think it was four months. I think he didn't eat for four months. And, um, you know, that's what happens when you have a breeding male. Sometimes they'll, they'll do that. And a lot of times they'll do that during breeding season. He chose to do it right after breeding season. As soon as he was done breeding, he was also done eating for four months. So it only started to concern me when we came upon breeding season again. And he was, you know, I wanted to start him again. But if he didn't get back on food, I wasn't going to start him breeding. Um, so here's here's what I did. He, I first of all, I waited and watched his behavior. And he was um, he was doing a thing at night where he would come out and sort of um, uh, perch himself in in ambush position, and then I would offer him food and he wouldn't take it. So I'd offer him, you know, he's used to eating frozen thawed rats. That's what I always feed him, and uh, he he wouldn't take it. So I you know I'd offer him food and then he wouldn't take it. So I'd put the food down. And then he'd go somewhere else and be in ambush position. Like he kind of, he, he likes to crawl up onto the, onto the, uh, stuff that I have on his bioactive enclosure. And, uh, so what, what I decided to do was, was go with, uh, African soft fur, which are not legal in California. So obviously this was a big problem because I had to fly his entire enclosure himself and me to a state where. African soft furs are legal so that we could do this because I would never break the law, you guys, or encourage that. Uh, but I got a hold of an African soft fur and uh, gave him, he immediately took a live African soft fur. That was his first meal. Uh, and then the next week I tried to feed him a th frozen thawed mouse. He didn't take it. So the next day I brought him a live mouse, took the live mouse. The next week, I tried to feed him a, a frozen thawed mouse again because I know that he'll he would per, he prefers mice even though I feed him rats all the time. If I give him a mouse snack, he loves it usually. So I knew that that was probably the next the next uh, step. So where are we at? We so I gave him the the live African soft fur, the live mouse. Uh, he wouldn't take a frozen thawed mouse the next week. So the following day, I got him a live rat and he took the live rat. The next week after that. He took a frozen thawed rat. So uh, I can safely say he's back on food, even though he did refuse the other day. <laughs> so, uh, which is okay. I don't need him eating every single week. He's he's fine to eat every two weeks. But you know, he lost a little bit of weight over those four months, and um, I'm noticing right now because I've got a I've got a big key light shining, and I can see he's got all these lifted scales up his back. So he's been scraping his back on something in that in that bioactive. I don't know if you guys can see that, but I can definitely see it where I am. He's got, he's messing up his scales. Um, anyway, he's, he's fine. It's not, uh, not a big problem. It'll fix itself in his next shed. But the point is that he is, you know, he's still, a uh, he, he looks, he definitely doesn't have extra fat on him. He is a muscular snake, but he's in good shape. And, um, gets a lot of exercise because when he chooses to come out, which isn't every night, but when he does choose to come out, he's all over the place, ruining his scales on his back. So, uh, anyway, that is how I got the inspector to go back on food. We're going to talk about some other feeding issues though, in this live stream, because, uh, it's come up a lot and there, there was a couple of questions I think on feeding, um, that people ask me in the last couple of days to, to cover in the live stream. So we'll talk about that. And then anything, anything that anybody wants to cover on, uh, just, you know, put it in here and I'll see it. Like, as you know, if you've been on my live streams before, you've seen the replays of them. I don't see everybody's comment. I try to get to all of them. If you super chat, I'm going to see it. Obviously 
Uh, and I'm going to try to see everybody's comments regardless of the super chat, but I, I do have to skip around a lot, especially if I get to over talking, which I tend to do sometimes. <laughs> I'll miss some stuff. Oh, and um, Ardbeg Ugadal is the scotch of choice for today. I almost forgot that I have scotch here. I have, I have a couple of things. Watch this. I've got Ardbeg Ugadal, which I haven't tasted in months. Mmm. It's so good, you guys. It's my favorite scotch. Um, Ardbeg, in general, is fantastic, but this Ugadal is lovely. Uh, and then the Harpers sent me some Yorkshire tea. Is it Yorkshire or is it Yorkshire? I don't know how to say it. Keith and Mary Harper mailed me some uh, some cold tea, which is really good, but this is um, a, a hot tea. Classic Yorkshire tea. Which is very tasty. I feel very British right now. Um, okay. So that's what I have. That's what I'm that's what I'm drinking. Yorkshire tea and um, Ardbeg. And I've got the inspector. Who, by the way, doesn't... You know, the inspector is not one who regularly comes out for long handling sessions. Um, he, I, I do take him out a couple times a week, but he doesn't spend a lot of time... Out, like he doesn't spend this much time out because I know that he prefers to to be in his uh, in his in his hide most of the time um, and I'm just inspecting him while while I have him out he looks good you look good buddy you look good you still got a bump on your nose I don't know if you guys can see that by the way I'm using my I'm using a good camera I finally figured out how to how to use a good camera rather than my webcam tell me if this looks better to you than previous if, if you've seen my other live streams let me know if it looks better to you okay so I'm gonna um, I'm going to see what you guys are saying hang on a second come on So we got some babies only taking live food. We'll talk about that. Um, that's a thing with babies, uh, depending on how old they are. Sometimes it takes a little bit. Um, so, okay, so let's talk about this for a second. Uh, Thea Hunter Spikerman. Spikerman? I'm guessing that's how you pronounce it. Could be wrong. Uh, snake strikes at her frozen thawed rats but doesn't eat. Pounds live rats, but that is not ideal for me. Ideas. So the striking at the rat and then not eating, is that's a defensive strike. Um, unless they're striking and coiling and then not eating. That's when, it, that's when it's tough because a, a food strike is when they strike and coil and wrap. Uh, but then if they decide they don't want to eat it, that I mean, it could be a number of things. But... Um, probably what's happening, my guess is what's happening with, with, in your case, is that the snake is just striking, uh, and, you know, just striking, which is a defensive strike. They're not seeing that as food. So, you know, one thing you can do, we're going to, we're, I'm just going to say different tips that I come up with off the top of my head that, because there's so many things that you can do to get your snakes to eat. But, um, one thing that you can do in getting your snake to take frozen thought is, uh, well, I'll, I'll go over what I always say, which is um, wait till the snake is hungry. And that, that might mean skip a, a week of even offering. Don't even offer, you know, next week. And wait, or don't offer for a couple weeks, depending on how big your snake is. You can give them a couple weeks off. Wait till they're really hungry. Uh, blow some, some scent into that enclosure uh, with a hairdryer. And don't offer until that snake comes out and is really hunting for food. Once they're hunting for food, you know that they're in food mode, and they'll they'll probably strike at your hand. So uh, striking at a frozen thawed rat and wrapping is is likely in that scenario. And <clears throat> excuse me, another thing that you could do is get a small live, and and let so so let's say that that your snake is on smalls and. You know, everybody has a different definition of small. I keep seeing this also as people go, oh, I'm feeding my snake a small rat. And then you find out that their snake is like 150 grams. So there's no way that it's eating a small rat. It's, they're 
fitting it a very tiny rat, but that's not a small. A small is a rat that's, let's say, this big, okay? Um, and so let's say that your snake is used to eating small rats. Get them a weaned, a live weaned, and let them eat that. Then feed them a frozen thawed weaned right after that because once they've eaten a, a meal that's about half the size that they're used to taking, they're going to be in food mode. They're, they're looking for another one. Um, because oftentimes, as, as many of you know, if you feed them a large meal, they're immediately looking for another one. They may, their stomach may not be able to handle it, but they're in heavy food mode. So that's a trick that works really well. Get, give them what they, what they want, a small meal of what they want. And then once they're in food mode, uh, get, that's actually how I, um, that's how I got Echo, my super dwarf reticulated python, to take Reptilinx. She refused a couple Reptilinx um, for a couple weeks. And I talked to Richard Bilbo about this. Um, and he suggested that I, that I give her a small mouse uh, or, a, or a hopper mouse, you know, frozen thawed because she's used to eating that and then follow that up with a small reptilink and that did it. She, she, the small mouse put her in food mode and she was ready to strike at anything I put in front of her after that without, without figuring out what it was. Um, so there's that, uh, bit of feeding stuff. Um, Yeah, so a lot of people here are talking about going from live to frozen thought. So those those things might work. Get that get that smaller live meal and and have a f smaller frozen thought on hand. Um, see if that works. Ball pythons are are tricky. You know, there's there's so many different things you can do. The thing about scenting also works. You know, sometimes uh, um, sometimes chicken broth will work. You you dip the head. Um, the head of the rat, not the head of the snake. You, you dip the head of the rodent in chicken broth, um, uh, or you dip the head of the rodent in, or not dip, but uh, put like a, a drop of vanilla extract on the head. That works sometimes. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? You know, I've tried, I, I have ASF juice from Reptilink, which is... Um, you would think would work, but for it hasn't worked for any of my snakes. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It just, I haven't had any luck with it at all. Um, but some people say that works. Uh, let's see. Um, this is a question. Uh, Nicholas is asking a question that, that a lot of people ask. Um, should you offer food if your ball pythons in shed? Um, sure you know, they may not take it. So you may end up wasting a rat if you don't have another snake to feed it to. Um, you know, I've got, I've got a handful of snakes that eat in shed, no problem. And some that refuse. I generally, I, you know, I think it's good for a snake to have a week off anyway, or two weeks off even of, of eating food. Snakes that, that eat regularly anyway, it's fine to give them a break. So sometimes I choose not to offer them food just because this is a good time for them to have a week off anyway. Um, but, but sure, you know, get offer and see, see which, which type of snake it is. I mean, usually they will stick with whatever they do. So I have snakes that I can reliably say they'll take a meal. They're in shed right now, but they're going to take a meal. Kata, for example, my, my ivory big girl never misses a meal. She could be deep in blue and she's going to, she'll strike food immediately always. So, um, and then there's other snakes that I wouldn't even try and waste a rat. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, so that much fancy. My juvenile hasn't eaten in seven weeks. I feel bad, but I don't want to give him live. I don't know what the history is, but I say this a lot, and I think it's really important. If you have a new snake, it's very important that you offer them the same meal that the breeder was, was offering, or the pet store, wherever you got it, whoever had it before and was feeding it exactly what they were eating is what you should be feeding them for at least the first meal or, or maybe two. So uh, if your snake was eating live before you got them, don't be trying to switch them right now as they're adjusting to their, to their uh, home. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people are against feeding live, but it's a snake and sometimes they got to eat live. So um, the best thing to do is to give them that live meal and then once they're eating and once they're established, you can work on switching them. Same thing, you know, one one trick to get them to, you know, if you've got a snake that is 
let's say that they're on frozen thawed and you've been feeding them frozen thawed rats and now they're on a food strike bring them a frozen thawed mouse you know um one mouse is not going to make them a mouser um so you know let, let them eat a mouse sometimes damara who's who's my biggest girl she'll refuse a rat but she'll take three or four jumbo mice so i do that with her if it's if it's breeding season i'll i'll give her i'll give her some mice if she wants mice um i'm a big believer of give them what they want to eat the other thing is you're going to hear a lot especially on facebook um you know, there's a thing about Facebook where people hear something on Facebook and then because they heard it on Facebook, they also put it on Facebook. So you hear this a lot, but it's not true. They People saying that mice are bad for snakes. It's not, they're not bad for snakes. They're the, the only downside to mice is that they are smaller and therefore they cost more. They're, they're slightly nutritionally less, slightly, but it's not like giving a kid a Twinkie. I, I read that all the time on Facebook. And um, I'm a lurker in these Facebook groups, you guys. I rarely post anything. And I definitely don't ever argue with anybody or try to correct anybody. Um, but I do, I, I read a lot of these posts. And they're like, oh, it's, you know, feeding a mouse is like feeding a Twinkie. It's really not. There's, there's a little bit higher fat content and uh, a little bit less protein. The bigger problem that I see is that with Lucille, who's, who's a big breeding female, she's... Um, almost 2000 grams right now. She's a mouser. I've only, I've only ever, uh, gotten her to take rats twice. She's taken two rats in, in her life with me at least. Otherwise she's a mouser. And, uh, so, you know, feeding her two or three jumbo mice instead of a small to medium rat, uh, is more expensive for, for me, but it's not that big of a deal. So anyway, there's my soapbox on that, uh, on that bit. And this thing, this thing, my soapbox on Facebook also. The other thing about Facebook that, that you'll notice is that somebody will ask a question and you'll get the first like couple of answers. And then the next answers are all the same answers that those first couple were. So it's just a thing. I mean, don't believe the stuff that you read on Facebook because um, just because an answer is written over and over doesn't mean that that's the right answer. That means that that was probably the first answer and everybody else is repeating it and they're trying to look like they, they know what they're talking about because they're repeating those first answers. Um, I've seen a lot of threads that go completely the wrong direction because somebody posts an outrageous first answer and then everybody follows up with that same answer. So um, anyway, that's my Facebook soapbox. Uh, <laughs> here we go. Um, let's see. That hot librarian, you're so nice giving me um, money for my scotch fund. Thank you so much for that super chat. Uh, that's, that's really sweet of you. You always give me scotch fund super chats. It's very nice. And without, not even with a question. Um, okay, let me try to get through this. I talked for a long time there, you guys. I went on a tangent. Um, also, let me know. I'll get to it eventually. But let me know what other snakes you want to see. Because I'm going to put him back here shortly. Um, he doesn't want to be here. He'd much rather be in his hide. Uh, and and by the way... Oh, I'm, oh, Keith says I'm saying it right. Uh, Yorkshire. Not Yorkshire. Even though that's how it's read. It's Yorkshire. Um, Miss Grimm, uh, I can't uh, share my source for African softwares. Because they uh, they are illegal in California. So... Um, uh, if you are in a state where, uh, where African soft furs are legal, that's great. Um, because it's, it's tricky to get them here for sure. Um, hi everybody. Let's see. I'm just saying hi to people that were saying hi a long time ago. Uh, let me just go through this really quick. Oh, I've already been there. Um. Cups of Exotics, thanks so much. Uh, they're in Malaysia. That's fantastic. I'm glad you're enjoying the videos. That's great. Um, uh, 
Uh, Eleanor, th this is a good this is a good thought. Um, you're you're asking how often should I offer food? My ball python has been off food for one month. Last meal was a large mouse a little over a month ago. A month is not very long at all for a ball python to be off food. Um, I I would offer each week, but uh, back to what I was saying before, it is it is a a technique in getting them back on food to not offer for a couple weeks. Don't even you know. Uh, ball pythons are creatures of habit. Justin Kabelka did a really good video about this where he where he made this point that ball pythons are creatures of habit and sometimes they just get in a habit of refusing food. And um, so they'll just refuse food, you know, every time you, you give them something. So if you, uh, if you wait a few weeks, you know, especially if it's, a, if it's an adult, you know, or a sub-adult that can totally wait a few weeks, Give, give them two or three weeks before you offer food again, and a lot of times they'll that'll get them back on food. Um, if it's uh, if it's a juvenile though, you know, a younger snake, I'd I'd keep offering each week and and maybe change it up. Try try live, try a different type, you know, stuff like that. Another um, another uh, item that is would be impossible, I think, to find in California because they're illegal is gerbils, and gerbils apparently. Uh, I've never had the experience, but gerbils are, are uh, ball pythons go for those pretty fast. So if you can easily get your hands on a gerbil, um, that might work. Okay, going back through. You guys also uh, just... Um, uh, just, it, it, this this is a basic thing, but make sure that your that your rodents are heated up. Um, they're they're warm enough, and warm for me for some of my snakes to to get them to really strike. 120 degrees. That seems really hot. It's not going to burn them because um, they're cooling down fast. But but I will I'll get that snake temp gunned their head. I mean not the snake the the rodent. Uh, temp gunned at 120 degrees. Um, I won't go much higher than that, but between 100 and 120 is, is, uh, what I'll do. So I'm saying that because I'm seeing that, that Thea is saying that her snake does coil. So this is back to the snake that, that was striking, but then not eating, but she, but will eat live. It might help Thea if, if you heat that rodent up a little, a little bit warmer so that by the time they uncoil, it's still warm and they can find the head. Sometimes, uh, snakes need that extra warmth to find the head otherwise if they can't find it they'll just they'll just lose interest you know uh so that could be what's happening um let's see i can feel the inspector in my shirt right now he is crawling around on my shoulder um catherine picking up your first ball python at tinley that's great um congratulations uh, go back to the beginning of this video and I talked about tips to uh, transition from live to, to frozen thought. There's a couple of, of really good tips there, but definitely start off by feeding them live. Oh, here's another thing, you guys, uh, that's really important, especially for a brand new keeper. This is usually not a problem. So I would say more than 50% of the time, with, with in my experience at least, and I would say 80% of the time, when I get a new snake that's only eaten live before. I give them one live meal. If they take it right away, the next week they're getting a frozen thawed. And I would say 80% of the time they take it. So this, this um, you know, all this talk about how to switch them, how to get them to switch. This is only, you know, I, I would say probably about 20% of the ball pythons that really struggle with, with switching where you have to do some tricks. Um, but the first thing to do is just try it and see if they'll switch. They probably will. It's, it's probably not going to be a problem. Uh, so, let's see. Uh, Jeff, that's a good uh, question. Do you notice quality problems if you buy frozen mice from corporate big box pet store? Yeah, I, I've never bought mice or rats from a big box pet store. I always order from... Uh, you know, I order from Lane Labs or Rodent Pro or Cold Brother, Cold Blooded Cafe. Um, 
I, I would not buy from a big box pet store because they're buying from a massive breeder that's probably feeding their rodents junk and the nutrition for a snake is in what the rodent was eating. Um, so I want, I want to make sure that, that uh, it's coming from a, a source that, you know, like Rodent Pro is, is big and Lane Labs are pretty big, but that's who zoos are buying from and who uh, other reputable snake people are buying from so you can you know for me it it seems like those animals are probably healthier and they always look good when they come in so um <laughs> soba says hi that much fancy uh that's a that's a good uh youtube name for you uh jessica soba says hi just finished shedding that's great um Oh, you guys, let's, I want to talk about this because I want to say something about soba too, Jessica, that, that you don't know because I forgot to tell you. Um, electrolyte soak. This is something I, I recently heard Austin uh, from Mutation Creation, but also Royal Highness Pythons. That's his, that's his company. Um, Austin has great, he, he's like 12 years old, but he's got fantastic tips. And the crazy thing is his best tips it, it's never a video about that tip. It's always a video about like, look at my clown ball pythons. And then he'll throw out some awesome tip about something totally unrelated. So I can never remember what videos uh, to go back to. But anyway, he had a video that actually was about how to get your ball python eating. And he, I had never heard this before, but this repped, this Zoomed electro, electrolyte soak, um, I picked up after he said that he gets his ball pythons eating again after a couple of soaks. In electrolyte, um, this is stuff that they'll that they'll drink and they'll also just soak it up into their skin. He also, and I think this is a great idea. He he uh, gives his females a soak in this right after they lay, and it it just gives, gets their electrolytes going. But I've been doing this for a couple of my snakes that are that are um, spotty eaters. They they don't eat great, so I give them Da Vinci um, supplement, which I've done a. Uh, video on before my my rule kind of is this is really it's for molly malone if you know my snakes and evie um and and it was for ron but ron's been eating better now uh so if they skip a meal i give them da vinci the the a few days later and if they skip a couple meals i'll start soaking them in this electro electrolyte i don't know if it's the da vinci or the electrolyte or combination of both but they're both eating pretty well now so um the, okay so the reason that this kind of relates to Jessica's snake, um, Soba, is is that uh, the other time I don't I don't um, suggest that people soak their snakes or bathe their snakes because it could potentially stress them out. And um, there are a few times though when it's when it's appropriate. Uh, and one of those times, I before I ship a snake out, I'll soak them for a half an hour to make sure that they're really well hydrated. A lot of times, just the trip can dehydrate them. So I want to make sure that they're that they get a nice soak and they get a good chance to drink a bunch of water. So before they go in that box, they get a half hour soak. Um, usually, it doesn't stress out the snake, and this is the reason that, that we don't that we don't bathe our ball pythons because it oftentimes can stress them out. And you definitely don't want them swimming. You don't want to swim your ball pythons. That'll really stress them out. What I do is give them a little bit of water. You know, maybe halfway up their body, so they're not floating at all. They're just in this water. So anyway, um, Jessica, just so you know, uh, when I soaked Soba, he did not like it. He the the only time I've seen any of my hatchlings in a ball, you know, like ball pythons do, in a tight ball, was when I soaked Soba. I felt really bad, but he got well hydrated. Um, but just so that you know. Uh, Anytime you think about potentially maybe soaking him for a bad shed or whatever, I wouldn't soak him. I'd give him a give him a humid hide or a or a um, you know pillowcase that's wet or something like that. So anyway, that's that. I like that Yorkshire tea. That's good stuff. All right. So now I look like a hunchback because I got a snake in my shirt. He's he's doing much better. He's much happier inside my shirt than out and about. But uh, let's see what other snakes you guys maybe want me to pull out because I'll um hang on okay we're gonna we're gonna get back to questions uh, I hope I hope this is good information that I'm giving you guys that that um, maybe you hadn't heard before or whatever 
Um, oh, good. Yeah, Lord. So Lori Torini told you not to soak. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I I tell people not to soak their snakes either. Um, although I do uh, occasionally for certain reasons. One of them is this electrolyte thing, and I and when I do it again, I make sure that they're not swimming, and I watch that snake. Uh, if it's a snake that the balls up, I'm not going to soak them again. So for instance, when I noticed that Sobo was completely balled up, I pulled him out of there. Um, it's probably five or 10 minutes instead of a 20 minute soak. Uh, so let's see. Um, Mackie, uh, good to see you on here. That's a good question. And I think the Harpers asked this question too. So you're asking, uh, what's a good new python species that you think would be a good addition to my growing collection and the harpers asked in fact i need i need to get to these live stream i mean these patreon uh, questions the harpers asked okay wait i'm gonna i'm gonna answer their first question first and then we're gonna get back to to um snake species the harpers are saying love the names that you come up with for your snakes and the ones you have suggested for others Example, Daryl from Accounting. Yeah, there's a snake out there named Daryl from Accounting, you guys, on my suggestion. Could you please suggest some names for our feisty new pied girl? Um, yes, congratulations on a pied. I like feistiness, and I like... Um, I'm going to pull him out of here. I, I like naming snakes based on their personalities sometimes, even though their personalities change over time. Especially feistiness will change over time. But, um, Joan of Arc, that's a historical feisty woman. And, and it could be an acronym. It could be J for Joan, O for of, A for Arc, and N for no, don't bite. It's kind of a terrible idea, but Joan, okay, Joan, um, Doctor. I like the idea of a snake named Doctor because somebody will come over to your house and go, what's your snake's name? Doctor. Oh, can I hold him? And then you can go, why did you assume it was a male? And yeah, you can hold her. I hope she wasn't offended. Let's see how she acts when you hold her. And then she bites him. It's a whole, this is a whole um, fantasy that I have in my head. So Doctor is a fantastic name. Um, and then I think the, the go-to name, though, probably for this particular snake would be Karen. So there you go. Joan, Doctor, or Karen. Or just pick one of the names you like that I named one of my snakes. Go that route. <laughs> um, there's a good chance you guys have already picked a name for the snake. Uh, but congrats on that pie. Okay, so back to Mackie's question and... Um, the Harpers also asked this, how would you rank the different species of potential pet pythons in terms of hardiness, ease of keeping alive, uh, blah, blah, blah. We were thinking of adding a different species. I love the idea of, you know, if you're, if you are into snakes and you're into ball pythons and you have the room and the, and the time and, and funds and whatever to add additional snakes, I love the idea of adding different species. Um, I can kind of answer this question, and but most of it is based on what I've learned through research and things like that, because I don't have hands-on experience with, let's say, Antaresia uh, species and um, uh, carpet pythons. I don't have a carpet python, but I would say this, that um, your most species of python are going to be pretty easy to keep. Um, the, you know... Retics, retics are easy to keep, but they're massive. So I would go with a dwarf or a super dwarf retic. Those are fantastic. Carpet pythons, uh, I believe, are are pretty easy to keep. Um, anything in the the well, anything the two members of the Aspidites are very hardy snakes. Wolmas and black headed pythons, super hardy. Um, and uh, the the an Antaresia, so those are the smaller snakes, the children's pythons and pygmy pythons and um, whatever else is in there that I can't think of, spotted pythons. Those are good, hardy snakes and really small in size. So that's that appeals to a lot of people also. I would say that a couple of 
species of python that might be a little bit more challenging are uh the what people used to call chondros the the green tree pythons um those are more difficult to keep you you have to keep them in a um you just have to be very careful with them uh their, their parameters are are very set in stone and if and if you uh mess up their parameters that might be a problem um and then like white-lipped pythons you know there are certain species that are that because we haven't bred them a ton in the united states their spiciness is has, has not um uh dwindled much so you've got white-lipped pythons the the northern white lips which are easier to get because they're way cheaper and then you've got southern white lips that are way more expensive the southern white lips are really cool they're the black ones and they are much less likely to bite less likely to bite the northerns are the ones that most people end up with and those are real spicy so i don't know that um I, I don't know what their hardiness is. I tend to think that they're a pretty hardy snake, um, but but I don't know. And uh, but I will say that that it's you know if you if you get a, a northern white lip, there's a good chance that they're gonna try to eat your face. So there's that, which is not always a problem. I have a snake that well she doesn't want to eat my face, but she wants to eat my hand every time I go in there. That's. Uh, Maya, my my black headed python. Let's talk about her for a second. Um, Maya, uh, as she's gotten more comfortable with her with her enclosure, which is just a, a quarantine tub right now, um, she is starting to display. I think her more normal behaviors, and one of them is she's real smart because as soon as the light comes on in that room, she's out looking. And she's looking for food, um, especially if it's at night. I've learned that I'm not going to try to handle her at night because she is on it. Anything that she sees, like she's tried to eat the the hook a bunch of times. She, if if I hook around her upper third and then try to pick her up on on her body, as soon as my finger touches her body, she whips around and tries to grab my finger because she thinks that might be some animal that's maybe food. Uh, so she's never defensive. These aren't, this isn't defensive anything. And she actually seems, you know, if I, I had her out today, I had her outside and, and uh, she never seems afraid or defensive or anything like that. She's totally chill coming out unless she's in food mode. Then she just wants to eat everything and she'll bite first and figure out if it's food later. So um, uh, she got, she has tagged me twice. Um, now I'm pretty fast. <laughs> no, no when she's going to do it. And she, she really, uh, she, she, she really got Lucy, um, who will be here. Let's see. Lucy's coming for a lesson and, oh, we got 45 minutes or so. Um, she, she got Lucy and that's in the black headed Python video. Uh, her being bit and her arm being wrapped <laughs> by Maya, which is really funny. Um, okay. I gotta, I gotta get through these. Uh, Lori, thanks for the super chat. Oh my gosh. That's such a nice super chat. I'm going to try a weaned live tomorrow night on Darwin. It's a good idea. Because uh, I think you were feeding smalls to Darwin before. Um, he's been hunting last night and tonight, so hopefully he'll take it. Marie just shed and is looking gorgeous. That's awesome. She'll be eating tomorrow too. Great. Um, I love Marie. That's, that's such a cool snake. Uh... So Darwin, um, yeah, we've been talking a lot about Darwin. The, so the deal is, if I remember right, he is around 500 grams. I thought he was smaller, but he's around 500 grams. So a small, small would be, would be about the right size for him. But I was suggesting that uh, Lori try a weaned with him because he hasn't been taking his food. So, you know, I think that's a good... He's been hunting last night and tonight. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to do. I, I would say, Lori, if Darwin does not take his rat, uh, go for a mouse ne next time and see if he'll take a mouse. Um, just to get him just to get him going again, you know. So, let me know how that goes. Um, okay. Okay, Crystal is saying the blackhead wants to see Maya. Um, that's tough. Maybe, maybe I'll bring Maya out at the end of this 
because she's technically still in quarantine, so I don't want to be touching any other snakes after I touch her. Um, conversations with KT. How many racking systems do you have? Well, a system. I have. I have a few small racks. I have. I have a couple of five tub grow out racks, and I have two, uh, three tub V seventy racks. Uh, you know, I don't have a huge collection. I have. I have eighteen snakes total, which um, is a lot. If you just own a cat and you don't know anybody who owns a snake. But as many of you know, that is nothing compared to what a lot of snake uh, keepers have. Okay. So, um, oh, there's other super chats. You guys are so nice. I'll try to get the inspector out of my shirt. Oh, Keith, thanks for the translation. 120 degrees Fahrenheit is 48.9 degrees Celsius. Appreciate that English to English translation. <laughs> uh, hey, how come you're... He, this guy breathes... You guys may have heard that. If you're if you're re-watching this, go back. Don't go back right now if you're live with me, but go back and see if you heard that bit of breathing that almost sounds like a wheeze. But he does this when he's moving over me and his, like his muscles are contracting. I'll hear him breathing. And it used to really scare me, but um, he's good. Uh... Oh, Eleanor, thank you so much. Thanks for that super chat. I really appreciate it. Nicholas, thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate that, man. Um... <laughs> Chamber and watching you live from the toilet. I bet a lot of people are. Uh, get over that COVID, buddy. Um, I I hope you're uh, I hope you're feeling better soon. Um, hey, Lori Trini's in here, you guys. Hi, Lori. Um, Northern Lights. Yeah, I'll I'll get uh, at, at the end of this. I'll get uh, the black hat out. I'm probably so far behind right now, you guys. I got. I'm gonna have to skip some of these. I'm sorry. If I skip yours and it's a question that you really want me to answer, put it in the comments and put Bob in capitals right before your question, and I'll and I'll make sure to grab it. Um, Catherine Ward, I don't think it matters. Perlite or vermiculite? I think I have vermiculite, but I don't know that it really makes a difference. Well, that's not true. I think perlite is probably less messy than vermiculite, um, but as far as as far as what they do, it, it doesn't matter. Um, hey, buddy, let me put you back, okay? How about that? How about that? So I don't have to fight you while you're trying to climb into the thing. Uh, you guys, I'm gonna put the inspector back, and um, I'm gonna get out just another snake. I don't know who it's gonna be. We'll see. Give me uh, two minutes. Two minutes. There you go, pal. Inspector is back. Let me see if anybody is up and moving. Oh, yeah, look at this. Dolly is up and moving. She wants to come out. Okay. So we got Dolly here because she was at the front of her tub. You guys, I love, if, if you have tubs, um, I think it's, it's, it's really important for me anyway that the tubs are clear so that I can see them and so that they also get some, some day-night cycle lighting. But uh, I like to be able to see who's in front of the tub and who's not. If Dolly's in front of the tub, that means that she is ready to come out. And um, normally I just open the tub and put my hand out there and she crawls out on it. But I didn't want to spend the time to have a slow python do that while I'm chatting with you guys. So, uh, Dolly, for those of you who don't know, is the first snake that ever hatched out of an egg here at Green Room Pythons. And she is so fantastic. Every time she's in shed, I think she's going to shed out that pink. That pink's going to go away and it's going to be white. And she hasn't yet. Like, it's not even close to going away. I don't know if you can tell, but this is a pink snake. Um, and I'm really surprised that, that it's not, it's not fading w with each shed. So we'll see. It, it will. I mean, she's not going to be an adult pink snake, but, uh, 
anyway, she's she's just really cool. And her and her back. This you probably can't see, but her back is is almost green. The these these brown patches on her back kind of go into a green. If I cover my face, will this focus? Maybe it's focusing. I don't know. I can't tell. Um, anyway, so now we got Dolly. Let's see if I can get through these. Um, leopard combos, conversations with KT. Uh, I have, I have one snake that is leopard and he is going to Molly Malone, my ultra Mel, and that won't be till next season. So I don't really have any leopards happening right now. Um, but I do love leopard. You guys were getting... Why, can't, why doesn't this move? Here we go. Oh, Lori, are you listing the um, the snakes that are good for... Yeah, this is, this is good, you guys. Look at Lori's comments on snakes that are that make really good pets because she has a lot more variety than I have. She's saying, uh, bread lie inland carpet, super dwarf free tick and an Angolan Python. Yeah. Angolans are fantastic. You guys, they are super beautiful. They look very much like a ball Python, but their patterning is amazing and they're bigger than ball pythons. And, um, they act differently. It's, it's kind of like having a big ball Python, but they're, they're more active. They, they move around a lot more. One thing that I love about ball pythons is that you can sit and watch a movie with them. I love pulling Damara out and uh, or having her come out of her tub and come over to me and I'll pick her up and put her in my lap and we'll watch a movie together. I wouldn't watch a movie with a super dwarf or certainly with a blackhead. Uh, but that's one thing that I really like about ball pythons. But also, it's it's not as interactive. you know. So there are snakes that are more interactive than ball pythons. And uh, Angolans are one of them. Um, okay, I'm skipping through here, guys. Sorry if I miss your question. By the way, if you guys don't know Lori Torini's channel, for those of you who don't know, you should go to it because it's all about snake behavior and training, and she gets really deep into it a lot more than I do, and she knows a lot more than I do about it, and uh, it's fantastic. So um, check out Lori Torini if you haven't already. Uh, let's see. I think I'm almost at oh my at the bottom you guys. Okay, great. All right, so now I'm going to um oh, is she on my hat? Is she up on my hat? I can't I can't see in the, Oh, she is. All right. So so we'll see what Dolly does here. I have more questions that I haven't even began to cover yet you guys by the way let me just do this before i cover these other questions patreon supporters thank you so much for your support um this the final snake that we're going to see tonight i hope i don't forget i won't forget we're going to get we're going to get maya out and as i said before here let me do the scroll a little bit better as i said before uh maya is a direct result of these patreon supporters because this was a snake that I really wanted to get for the channel, but um, God, I'm holding my head in such a weird way because I can feel her on me, but I can't tell where she's at. Oh, there we go. But, uh, you know, it was I wasn't going to get a blackhead for a long time. It just was kind of on my list as a, as a dream snake. And it turned out that um, that I found this blackhead and the, the uh, person who, who was selling her, that bred her, uh, he's a really great guy, um, was willing to give me a screaming deal on it. And 
I was able to use some funds from uh, from Patreon to justify the uh, the buying of that. You guys, look at my look at my new Patreon board right here. Emery, Robert, Matthew, thanks so much for joining recently. Appreciate that. So, really appreciate those Patreon supporters. Look at Dolly coming around. Now, I've learned that I have to be really careful on this hat because these snakes can't hold on. They love it because it's a it's a ledge for them, but they slide off it really easily. So I gotta be I gotta be careful. Um, all right. So going back to the questions. All right, we talked about the different types of snakes, and Lori is uh, answering that as well. I think I just scared the snake that's on my hat. Um, Apart from size, weight, are there any factors that influence when royal pythons are ready to become parents? Um, yeah, I mean, size and weight are the are the uh, I mean, age and, and weight are the main um, factors uh, to determine whether your snake is ready. But also health, you want to make sure that your health your snake is in really good health uh, and their body condition. So, are they eating regularly right now? You know, like the inspector, as I said before, if I didn't get him to eat, he would not be breeding this season. So those factors uh, are, are things to think about. Um, when roaming with supervision, our, our snakes sometimes manage to get themselves into spots from which it is difficult to remove them. Again, any tips for dislodging them, or is it just a case of waiting for them to dislodge themselves? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's a case of, um, for me, it's a case of don't let them get where, where they're trying to get to. Because I don't particularly enjoy moving furniture to have to get to my snakes. Although I'm often moving this couch to put snakes away. Uh, but it's, you know, it's it's about redirecting them if, if they're going somewhere where they're not supposed to go. And then uh, if they do get themselves lodged somewhere else, what I find works really well because... As you know, anybody who's tried to get a snake dislodged, grabbing them and pulling them away from where they want to be is not going to work, right? So you have to you have to motivate them somehow to move out themselves. That's that might be touching their tail. Um, with this isn't really a ball python thing, but with Echo, a lot of times Echo, I need to get her off the ladder and she's wrapped herself around. And so what I'll do is offer her my hand, and when she comes to explore my hand. She doesn't always, but she oftentimes will come to explore my hand and she'll kind of hang on to the, to what she's hanging on to. And I'll just slowly, really slowly pull her away from wherever she's at, whatever she's on. And she, because I'm moving away and she wants to stay on my hand, she'll keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. And eventually she'll let go of, of what she's on. And this also works with Stella. In fact, this is a good segue to give you a Stella update. Stella, for those of you who don't know, is my other super dwarf reticulated python. She's 100% Kalatoa. Um, and she's technically still in quarantine also. they've they've uh, Stella and Maya have been in quarantine for about six weeks. And I want to give them about another six weeks. But they, they both seem very healthy. And um, uh, I'm not worried about them at all. But I just, I'm keeping them in, in their own quarantine uh, situations right now. And so with Stella, I still want to give her exercise and I, and I want her to be able to um, be out and climb and, and move around. Uh, but I don't want her on Echo's ladder until she's out of quarantine. So I have a lighting strip on the ceiling. I've got, I've got some track lighting on the ceiling that I, t I hang two bungee cords from and connect the bungee cords to one of those, to one of those holy roller balls, you know, those uh, rubber balls. And she starts on the ball, and she climbs up the bungee cord, and then she's on the track lighting. I make sure the lights are off and they're cooled down, you know, so she's not getting onto anything hot. But she crawls across those track that track lighting and gets all kinds of exercise. And when I want to pull her down, she's at the point now, this is six weeks in, she's at the point now where she is interested in coming onto my hand. So I can reach way up, sometimes I'm standing on a stool, giving her my hand, and as soon as she starts to crawl onto it, I do the same thing with her, is just slowly pull away and she slowly keeps coming and eventually she'll release from where she's at. So um, I'm really happy with with both my new snakes but but really happy with the fact that that Stella already will will uh, come onto my hand and no problem. Maya will also come onto my hand but 
it's because she wants to eat it. So <laughs> right now, uh, with Maya, she um, well, we'll talk about Maya when I when I get her. Um, okay, let me look at this. Uh, Shlee Delate, uh, D Dalk, um, Dalky, Dalk, Shlee Dalky. Man, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm so sorry. But thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Can you discuss more about the breathing noise during movement? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, you're right. I kind of glossed over that, and that's kind of an important thing. Um, my little buddy makes some squeaky breathing sounds. The vet doesn't think it's a respiratory infection. Yeah. So here's the thing. We always hear that if you're if you hear your snake breathing, that means respiratory infection, and it doesn't necessarily. Um, so there there are some other things with the respiratory infection. You know, if, if you see saliva, if they're hanging their mouth open, if um, you know they say yawning excessively, but it's not even a yawn. It's that they they're opening. They're just opening their mouth excessively, um, uh, and when they open their mouth, you're seeing strings of saliva. If you, a lot of times, I'll just, without opening their mouth, I'll take my thumb and just open the side of their mouth to check for excess saliva. Uh, that's a, you know, that's something that you can sort of, hi, can I do this to you? Can we do this really fast? Where I'm just, oh, now I have to turn. Hi, can I see your face really fast? Just take her and, and just sort of do this. Just kind of that motion. And, uh, I didn't actually do it, but but it's just that motion to, to, to open that bottom lip to see if there's excess bubbles or saliva. Um, but back to the breathing, a lot of times, especially on a bigger snake, you normally you won't hear anything from a small one like this, but especially on a bigger snake that's using a lot of muscles, especially if they're if they're bringing their lungs over your arm or over, you know, pulling themselves up over something, you'll hear them breathe. Um, there are also snakes that that breathe more audibly than others, just like people breathe more. I probably breathe more audibly than most human beings. That doesn't mean I have a respiratory infection. It just means that I'm a fat guy trying to walk somewhere. So that's, uh, you know, that's what happens with our snakes sometimes. Um, so look for those other cues of respiratory infection. If you're hearing a whistling, a wheezing whistling, that that's more of a problem than just occasionally hearing them breathe, especially when they're exerting effort to crawl over something. Um, great question. Lori's saying, I'm surprised how much I love my Angolan python. Um, I'm going to have to look. You probably have videos on your Angolan, Lori, but I haven't seen them. I'm going to have to look at that because I, I love Angolans. I think they're so pretty. Such cool snakes. I was playing with one at the um, Pomona show. Oh, Destry, I almost I almost missed your super chat. Thanks so much. Thanks for the super chat. Um, sorry, I, th I somehow skipped over that. I'm glad I went back up. Uh, what's your opinion on misting systems for ball pythons? No. Um, let me f see. Ours is in a glass tank with ventilation, and it's hard to keep the humidity. Let's see. Glass tank with ventilation. It's hard to keep the humidity levels, even in its humid hide. Yeah. So, uh, no on misting systems for, for many species. And the reason is that misting systems are a breeding ground for bacteria, and that's a good way to uh, give your snake a bacterial respiratory infection. So, uh, and they also generally don't need it. Um, you know, there there are people that have their snakes in tanks, in fish tanks, in the middle of the desert, and have figured out how to how to keep the the um, humidity correct without having a misting system so uh, what I would say is that cover up your ventilation yours, you said yours is a glass tank with ventilation so cover that ventilation up You're, you probably have a screen top so you want to put foil tape over the top of that screen top or plastic or something so that almost all of it is covered or all of it if you can cover all of it I don't know if you have stuff on top like um, uh, CHE or whatever that you need to keep uncovered but cover up as much as you possibly can and then use use cocoa husk I mean there are other substrates forest floor stuff like that but cocoa husk works really well you mix the water into the cocoa husk 
and instead of spraying or misting because that just gets the the moisture over the top of everything and it just evaporates immediately so you want to literally pour a little bit of water into the cocoa husk and mix it around make sure it gets all soaked up by the cocoa husk and then you've got some good humidity levels especially if that ventilation is covered so that is the way to do it um good question i see a lot of people spending 150 bucks on a misting system and um not for this species not not a good idea it's a good idea for like a i don't know a, probably a chameleon maybe no not a i don't know what but the you know the more jungle jungle uh, type creatures. Um, okay, did I miss? I hope I didn't. You guys, if I missed anybody else's super chat, if I miss, if you did a super chat and I miss it, make sure that you put Bob in caps right before your questions. I <laughs> make sure to see it. Um, Let's see. Glad you guys are here. Those of you who are catching the live for the first time, really cool. Thanks for being here. I know it's it's tough. It's tough to know what time to do a live stream because I know not everybody can make it. Um, and, and, you know, my, uh, my live streams are always sporadic. I do lives when, you know, if, I, if I'm performing the weekend before and I know that I can't work on a video, I, do, I end up doing a live. That's basically why we do lives. Um, if I can't double up or triple up on videos, we do a live to give me a little bit of time to get, to get other videos out. So it's never, you know, it's never, uh, we never know what day specifically it's going to be on until like the week before. But then I usually do them Tuesdays at, at 5, my time. Uh, Prime Zcon, congrats on your first ball python. That's great. You're getting an albino pinstripe. Nice. Uh, that's great. Well done. And good job doing your research ahead of time. That's fantastic. Um, Robert Belolovsky, uh, thanks for being here. Well done. Um, you're not going to be here long. That's all right. You can come back and... What happened? I just missed the thing. I'm sure you'll come back and watch the rest of it, but uh, thanks for being here. I just I just lost my place, you guys. Um, oh, Lori, thanks for reminding me. Lori's saying check out Bob's Discord. Uh, yeah, check out the Discord, you guys. Um, green, uh, the Python Green Room on Discord. And uh, it should be on all the videos. Might not be on this one yet, because I don't, I don't know if I put it on there but on all the videos now there should be a link that works the the original link that i put to the discord apparently um expired and so people couldn't find it but now the link that's in all those videos should work so um that's that's been fun i haven't been able to be on that discord as much as i'd like to be just because i've been so busy with other stuff but I love that there are people on there answering other people's questions. There's a lot of a lot of beginners on there and a lot of uh, seasoned ball python uh, keepers, and people are answering questions. I'm going in answering stuff and and contributing as much as I can. Um, but that's a fun little Discord. It's it's becoming a, a nice community. Um, let me real quick go through some of these other questions that I haven't been able to do yet. Um, Oh, Lori, the other thing, uh, Lori Weiser, about Darwin, we talked about Darwin already, but I made a note here. Um, you might, you know, try... Okay, so if he doesn't take the smaller rat this week, try the mouse next week, and then you may want to try a substrate change. Just, this is another trick, you guys, that sometimes we'll get them eating. Just give them, put them on paper, or, or put them on, just find something different that's a different substrate. Um, just a change like that, might get them eating again and it's not that they didn't like their substrate before it's just that it's a change it's just something different and it and it might get them to eat so that's an idea um oh ian hey thanks for the super chat man i appreciate that good to see you uh let's see oh because it's middle of the night for you <laughs> he, he just woke up um got to work in two hours oh thanks man i really appreciate that so you just came in and came on to say hello 
and send me 10 bucks and then you're going back to sleep before you go to work that's really nice Ian I appreciate that man thanks for your support um, glad you're here uh, let's see Zachary uh, Zachary Adkins thank you so much for reminding me that I have Ardbeg next to me I completely forgot um, and welcome sounds like you just maybe found the channel and you got your first ball python two months ago congratulations on the new ball python and thanks for reminding me that I've got Ardbeg here I get to talking and I forget that I have that man you guys that core of wrecking is so good it's it's potent it is um it's 54.2 abv abv yeah which is high uh but man it's so good okay so, all right so now we're now we're back to this um so carol uh carol saying let's see so you're trying to so Carol, you're trying to switch your snake to frozen thawed, but that's not your question. Oh, your question is about poop, and this is good. Um, I've had a number of people ask me if I would do an entire video on snake poop, and I might, um, but I don't know. I mean, I feel like it'd get a lot of views if I just called it snake poop. I think people would click on that. You know, it's almost like clickbait, but it wouldn't be bait because it would be literally a video about snake poop. Anyway. Um, so this is a great question, uh, Carol. I, uh, I have him in a vivarium with isopods and springtails, and as far as I can tell, he has not pooped yet. So she's had her snake since December. Um, so, so we are, what, three months in? Uh, I check often and have seen no evidence. Is it possible that the cleaners are doing such a great job I won't see it? Not sure how often they go. Um, so no, that's not possible. They're, your springtails are the ones that are going to be, well... Yeah, I don't think isopods are eating poop. You'll see springtails on the poop. Uh, the isopods are more eating uh, organic matter that that falls off the plants. You know, they're they're eating um, little pieces of wood and and leaves and stuff like that. I don't think they're eating poop, but they definitely would not just eat it all all of a sudden. Uh, so you will see it in there, and you still have to spot clean um, uh, bioactive vivariums. And how often they, they go is up to the snake. Some snakes go a couple days after they eat every time uh, they'll poop. Uh, some snakes will poop every six weeks. Some will poop only when they shed. Some go like the day after they shed. For instance, Kata, who's a big, giant, um, ivory female. She's almost 3,000 grams. She only poops when she sheds and it's the day after and so she shed the other day and then the next day she pooped twice so i had a big pile and for a snake like that as you all know that that have big snakes it's like a dog went into their enclosure and pooped she had a big pile here and a big pile here so she she saved up two basically until she shed um but they just go when when they go so what I'll say though is be really and and I know I think you said that that you're you're pretty careful about checking but but really check because you don't want to leave it in there. Um, that's when that's when bacterial respiratory infections happen is is if you leave poop or urh or whatever in there. Um, the inspector a little over a year ago got a respiratory infection and I believe it was because I was not being clean enough in in his hide like I wasn't I wasn't wiping out his hide box and and. Uh, using F10 to wipe out, wipe off the glass where he normally sits under under the thing, and um, now I'm much better about that. But I think that's probably how he got his respiratory infection. You never know for sure, but um, you know, it was probably my fault. Um, so everybody should learn from my mistakes. Uh, all right, let me see what else. Oh, Underbelly Exotics asked this on um, Instagram at Green Room Pythons. Underbelly Exotics is asking about overproduction, what I think of overproduction and culling for non-medical reasons. You know, I haven't heard much about that in the ball python world. Um, and, well, certainly there is overproduction of ball pythons. And, um, you know, there, there's a thing with, like, 
if people are just breeding a bunch of normals to breed normals, my my personal feeling is this: that a a normal is usually going to be bought by somebody young who has twenty five bucks to buy a snake, and they're going to throw them in a fish tank until. Not that fish tanks are bad, but that's just where it's going to end up going because those are inexpensive too. They're probably going to throw it in into a fish tank, and um, uh, you know when they go off to college, they're going to get rid of it, and it's going to end up at a shelter. If you um, look at the reptile rescues and see all the ball pythons in there, those are normals and like pastels. Uh, so. I think that, that those probably should not be produced. If you have a normal ball python, um, unless you're pairing it to something that's that's going to uh, produce something more desirable, uh, I would say normal to normal is not a thing that, that should be uh, should be produced. Um, and you know, it's the tough thing is that this like this snake here. This is just a paint job. This is the same snake as a normal. It's just a paint job. But the fact is that if you pay several hundred dollars for an animal, A, you're probably not a 12-year-old, and um, B, you're you're probably going to do some research and care for that animal and keep that animal. It's not going to go from, from person to person and, and not be cared well for because it only costs 25 bucks and whatever. It's a disposable animal. So that's kind of where I come from with that because it is the same animal and normals are great. They're fantastic. They just, because of the price point on a, on a snake like that, you're selling them to younger kids or you're selling them to adults who are buying their kid a snake that is that they consider a starter animal, which means disposable animal. Um, I think I talk about that in next week's video, but anyway. Uh, culling for non-medical reasons. So I've heard of this potentially happening in reticulated pythons, and it's such a bummer. This is what, what we're talking about, you guys, is like uh, a big breeder that's breeding snakes for the specific genes that they want. And any snake, because retics, you know, will have a clutch of 50. So they'll pull out the ones that they want or the ones that they want to sell, and the rest get killed or get fed to... to you know, um, cobras or, or other snake eating reptiles. And, uh, yeah, I don't like that at all. And I hope that that's not happening with ball pythons. Um, I, I tend to think that it's happening, you know, nobody's going to talk about that. So whether that's actually happening or not, I don't know. I, I will say that there is a much smaller market for retics, um, especially people that can, that can handle a big snake like that. And when you're, when you're a big breeder that's producing hundreds of clutches and those hundreds of clutches are, are 30 to 50 eggs per clutch, where are all those snakes going? You know, um, but for ball pythons, we're talking about six egg clutches and the really big breeders, we know, like we watch their videos, we know what they're doing with their snakes and they're also not producing a lot of normals. So I don't know how much it's happening in, in ball pythons. I, I hope it's not happening. That's that long answer. Um, is there anything else that I'm missing other than just going back to the questions that are coming in right now? Uh, no, I think I got it. Okay. Fantastic. It is 6.15 right now. Um, all right. Let me, get, let me go back to... Let me see if I'm missing anything here. And then and then I'll get you guys are asking to see Maya, so I will get Maya. Um Eleanor, what's your position on feeding outside of the enclosure? I don't think it's necessary to do. Um I will say this though. It's a technique since since this is a, a video on getting your snake to feed again. It is a technique. You could try it. If your snake's not eating, you could try putting them in a bag with a meal or in a tub, in another tub with a meal, or whatever. Um, it's it, to me, it's not necessary, and it's definitely not a thing where snakes get cage aggressive. I, when I, I'm talking about ball pythons, when ball, it's not a thing that ball pythons get cage aggressive if you uh, if you feed them inside their enclosure. They should eat inside their enclosure because that's their home and that's where they're used to being and doing all their things. So they should eat in their enclosure. Um, that being said, 
I, and I said this in a video before, I think that w with my snakes anyway, and I know my snakes, I think that if I pulled Dolly, for instance, out and put her in a tub and fed her and she ate, and then I picked her up and put her back in her hide, she would not regurgitate. There is a there is a, a um, risk of regurgitation when you feed a snake outside their enclosure because if that snake isn't used to human interaction and it stresses them out to be picked up and moved, um, they could they could regurgitate that that meal. Uh, and actually, not all my snakes. I bet I bet you know Kata is is a really big snake, and if she she's the ivory that I was talking about before, if Kata ate a really big meal. And I know that she's not, she's never defensive or anything, but she's less comfortable with, with me picking her up. Um, uh, if she ate a really big meal and then I picked her up, that might cause her to regurgitate, you know. But I also think that, that it's, a, it's a rare ball python that would, that would spit up their meal because they were moved. Um, but it could happen. So there's just no reason to, to feed outside of, of an enclosure unless you're using it as a one-time deal to try to get your snake to eat. And then, by the way, it's really simple. You take the snake out, you put it in a separate enclosure, see if they eat. If they do eat there, that's no problem. You just pick up that enclosure, that tub, it's probably gonna be a little tub, and you just set it next to their enclosure and let them crawl back into their enclosure and find their warm side hide. You don't have to manhandle the, the snake, you know. Um, and, you know, we were talking about Lori Torini. Lori feeds her, her uh, snakes outside the enclosure all the time because she's targeting them out of their enclosure and then targeting them back in. Um, I did it with Echo the other day. I fed her outside of her enclosure because I targeted her out and then gave her her, her reward, which was her meal. Um, it was very small. I gave, she, she ate two small quail yesterday. Uh, so, but, but then she went back into her enclosure on her own, which I knew she would do because she just does that. Uh, so that kind of feeding outside their enclosure is is different though than picking them up, plopping them into something else, feeding them all the time in that thing, picking them up, plopping them back. You know, there's a difference. Uh, so that's my thought on that. Great question. <laughs> I love this, Dwayne. The next question is Bob. What's your opinion on frozen thawed quail? Uh, which I just said I was feeding frozen thawed quail yesterday. I'm in Texas and some feeder suppliers here are offering quail as a high protein feeder. I don't think that they're great for ball pythons um, as far as new, the nutrition that a ball python needs. And uh, I actually, you know, I haven't looked at the nutritional uh, comparison between a rodent and a, and a quail, but I believe that for what a ball python needs, they're gonna get, they're gonna get more of what they need out of a rodent that's the same size as, as a quail that you would feed them. I feed quail to my blackhead. Uh, she gets a lot of quail and and occasionally the the super dwarf reticulated pythons will eat quail because I want them to have a, a much more varied diet uh, because they should. But I think for ball pythons, my, my initial thought is that a quail is probably not enough for them as far as nutrition. Um, I could be wrong though. I have, like I said, I haven't looked at the the actual numbers, but I think birds in general are going to be less than than what a rodent would would be. Um. <laughs> yeah. So Lori's saying mine eat everywhere. Uh, it's distress that may impact eating and regurgitation. Since the animal isn't distressed, they're hungry, they're fine eating wherever. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, so Lori is um, Lori knows her stuff, obviously, and that's that's exactly what I was saying. Is if if your snake is not distressed, they can eat wherever they want to eat. You know, um, I've thought about feeding Echo actually on her ladder, uh, but she fights me sometimes when it's time to put her back in her enclosure. So I don't want her to eat and then and then fight me on, oh no, I don't want to leave my ladder. So I haven't done that. Um, but uh, if I know that, that the snake is not going to be in any distress, I'll, I'll feed him somewhere else. Um, I haven't with the ball pythons. I don't think I've ever fed a ball python outside of their enclosure. But uh, other than like targeting, you know, the ones that, that, uh, that I'll, t I'll target them like halfway out of their tub, give them their meal, and then they'll go back in their tub on their own. But I haven't brought them completely all the way out. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to put Dolly back right now, and let's get Maya, the black-headed python. That'll be the final snake of the night, since she's technically still in quarantine. Um, and let's see how this goes. So <laughs> this might take me more than a minute. Talk amongst yourselves. Thanks for sticking with me. Here we go. All right, Dolly is back. Okay. We're almost there, folks. That was real sketchy. So Maya, um, she actually ate a pretty big meal yesterday for, for what I've been giving her. Um, so feeding, let, let's talk about feeding this snake, by the way. We we talked about this in uh, we talked about this a bit in the blackhead video, and my guess is that not everybody that's into ball pythons watched the blackhead video because it's, it's a different snake um, than than what the ball python people keep. But it is interesting; these guys are reptile specialists, so they're eating ninety percent reptiles in the wild, and Maya. Um, gets I, I got iguana reptilinks for her really small ones smaller than than you would think like normally you would get a reptilink that's about the same width of her body and you'd give her that if she was a ball python you'd give her that reptilink uh once a week or once every two weeks or something like that these snakes are eating a lot more often in the wild so she's getting a sm really small reptilink that she she can like bite it and have it eaten in probably 20 seconds uh, and she's getting small quail chicks. Yesterday she ate a day old chicken. And when I gave that, that was the biggest thing that I've ever given her uh, a day old chick, you know, like chicken chick. Uh, and um, as she was eating it, because it was so big, I was doing that new keeper thing where I was like, oh no, did I give her something too big? She's not going to be able to handle it. And then I realized, wait a second, in the wild, she'd be eating stuff way bigger than this. This is just. You know, and it put a lump in her belly, and that lump is basically gone today. Um, they have a really high metabolism, so I'm feeding her usually a couple of really small items. In in one feeding, she'll get two or three really small items, uh, and she she gets fed twice a week, basically. Um, and uh, she seems to do really well on that. Again, I've only had her for about six weeks or so, uh, so I'm sure that her feeding will change based on things that I find out or whatever. But right now that's what I'm doing. Uh, so she's getting a varied, I'm going to, I'm going to start giving her sardines. Um, not ones that you get in a can, but I'll go to a, like an Asian market where they have the fish. That's just the frozen fish with no oils or anything on it. And she'll get fish and she'll get poultry and, and, uh, Occasionally a rodent, you know, I'll give her a small mouse maybe once a week. She'll she'll get a rodent. Uh, so that is Maya. And check her out, you guys. For those of you who know what a black-headed python normally looks like, they don't usually have this deep, dark... This is what uh, Derek Roddy was telling me, that, that they call this ladder back. It's not a gene, though. It's a it's a polygenic trait. And it could mean het for, for a couple of different things. But exanthic, a lot of head exanthics have ladder back. And um, the, from what I'm told, the stock that she came from was an exanthic uh, snake or a head exanthic snake. So she's pos head exanthic. And uh, 
I don't know that I'll end up trying to prove that out or whatever. But I just I love the ladder back. I love this dark back that she has with these with these dots along it. Um, so what she does is um, she'll try to like she'll try to strike and, and wrap. She'll she'll go for that, but uh, they oftentimes don't wrap. You know, if I give her frozen thought item, she'll just start eating it, and uh, right off the tongs. Um, but she will. The other thing that that the Aspidites um, snakes will do that's blackheads and walmas both will do this thing. I'm trying to see if she'll do it right now. Where they're they're diggers, so they so they go nose first into your into your arm or whatever, and then they'll just kind of slowly open their mouth and chomp, and then they got you. <laughs> so there's really kind of no warning whether they're going to do that. I believe though, and we'll see. She might prove me wrong here today. Once I have her out, she hasn't she hasn't chomped on me. It's only been the times that she's tried to eat me or has has bitten me the two times. It's been when I'm taking her out of the enclosure and she doesn't understand what's going on yet. She thinks she's being fed. Now that she's out, I think she knows who I am or she knows that this is not feeding time. But if I handed her off to you, she, that's a different smell and she'd probably, she'd probably go for it. Um, so let's go to the comments. Let's see, let me go back to where I'm at. Let's see. Okay, there we go. So, oh, Keith, that's a that's a really good thought. Um, you're saying that Ambassador Ambassador Noodle, uh, who's one of your snakes, is partial to a chick as a snack, but her main meals are always are always the rats. Yeah, I've actually given um, I gave uh, Lydia Dietz my clown ball python. She had a she had a chick once because I thought it out for Echo. And I thought it looked too big anyway. Like the one that I was trying to give Echo, I thought, ah, oh, it's probably too big, but maybe it's just feathers. So I thought it out anyway and realized, no, that's definitely too big. Um, and so I gave it to Lydia Dietz and she, she'll eat anything. So not all ball pythons will take a chick, but Lydia certainly did and she was happy to have it. It's a little snack. Um, Lori's asking where Kent, where's Kent, and I feel really bad because Kent is not here tonight. Uh, but we did say in a fairly recent video that I was going to make Kent be here for a live, and I haven't done that, you guys. I think we've done two lives since then, and Kent's not been here. And I apologize for that. I will make Kent be here for, I want to say the next live, but if I forget, then I'm going to feel really bad. I will try to make Kent be here for the next live. Lori, you can be in charge of reminding me if you want. Um, the Repticult, thanks so much. I appreciate your uh, kind words. I'm glad that you're enjoying the content of the channel. Um, yes, Reptilinks are an awesome product. I, I really like them. I have been feeding them to... I, I get the... Uh, I forget what they're called, but but it's the it's the main Reptilink bundle where it's like it's like rabbit and quail and guinea fowl and uh, I don't know hamster not hamster I'm kidding but a whole bunch of different animals all in one and it's whole prey and then you can order you pay a couple dollars extra and it, and it's mixed up with with I think quail egg but some kind of egg um, so I get those for the super dwarves. And then Maya just gets, and I love that they do this because it's really the only way that you can get reptiles into a reptile eater. And they've got these iguana reptilinks, and my my guess is that they're that they're getting the meat from um, from the invasive iguanas in Florida. Who knows though? I mean, maybe not because maybe that's that would potentially be tainted. I don't know. I don't know where they're getting it, but uh, it's really cool that they have it available because I I love the idea of being able to feed. Reptilinks to to Maya. She she is getting at least one Reptilink 
at every meal because the ones that I ordered are so tiny. So she actually, even though she got a big chick yesterday, she ate a Reptilink before that. So she's she's got a Reptilink and a chick that she is um, probably almost done digesting at this point. That was 24 hours ago. Uh, they've got a fast metabolism. Um, and you guys are seeing she is moving constantly. She's always... And she's never, she's never seemed to act afraid. She just wants to explore and she's not trying to, you know, it's not like she's trying to get away. She's just always moving, always exploring. You know, her head always looks wet. Can you see, let's see, can I get close enough? Dang it. Hi. Can you, can we move your head to the camera, please? Look at that. Look at that shiny head. There we go. Look at that shiny head. It's pretty great. Um, thanks, Lori. I appreciate... Lori says, Maya is absolutely gorgeous. I think so, too. She's so pretty. Yeah, she is a... She is a... She would eat an Aki monitor, for sure. Um, and she would she would eat venomous snakes in, in Australia. She would eat, like, a death adder. A little one, but she would eat one because they're apparently immune to the venom of those snakes, which I think is fascinating. So cool. Uh, let's see. Northern Lights asks, are you going to breed her? You know, the day that I bought her, I went, you know, I'm just getting a blackhead to be an ambassador. I've always wanted to work with blackheads. Not going to breed her. And then 24 hours later, I went, well, you know, she's not going to be breeding age for another few years. So I'll probably, probably breed her. And then I'm talking to Derek and De Derek, I've, I've had uh, several conversations with Derek Roddy, who is, uh, for those of you who don't know, he was on the, he was, uh, he, he was in on the blackhead video that, that I put out recently. We did a zoom call together, but I've talked to him several times and he's like, man, I've got the perfect, perfect male for, for that snake. That's het for both lines of exanthic and blackheads and uh <laughs> so it's like a four thousand dollar snake i'm not gonna buy a four thousand dollar snake um but uh i do th the the long answer or the short answer is yeah i probably will breed her is, is my guess because i like the challenge i like the i like the idea you know um blackheads the reason that blackheads are very expensive is that there's not a big supply of them. And the reason there's not a big supply of them is you've got to be a very patient breeder to breed black-headed pythons. Um, they are, they were difficult to hatch. I think they probably still are, but but it's kind of figured out. The, tri the, the trick of hatching them has been figured out. Um, the bigger problem is once they're hatched, the babies don't eat. They are, they are, since, since they're reptile specialists, we have to try to teach them to eat mammals, basically. And um, so you've got to pretty much uh, assist feed the entire clutch, sometimes for a long time, sometimes for months before, before they'll start taking rodents on their own. And um, I've got some, some ideas for that. Like I'd, I would love to, if I, was, if I had a clutch of, of blackheads right now that I was assist feeding, I'd be, I'd be giving them the iguana reptilinx and seeing if they would take those. But uh, that's probably been done, you know, um, but I don't know. Anyway, I like the challenge and, uh, would want to, would want to try. Are you guys at Lucy? Are you out there? Come in. Come in. Hi. No, hi. Come in. Yeah, Is your mom coming in too? No, I don't think so. And I'm sorry we waited. Um, she had to go to Chick-fil-A. That's all right. I'm still on this live stream. Uh, you guys, Lucy just walked in. You all know Lucy. Um. I'm sorry. I'm still eating my burger. That's right. Uh, so anyway, do you want to see if you want to hold Maya and see if she'll bite you? I'm eating a burger. No. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. I'm kidding. Uh, for those of you who watched the black-headed python, Lucy is, I mean, the black-headed python video, Lucy is the one that Maya was uh, trying to eat in that in that video. Uh, so, what was I saying? I completely forgot. We, we were talking about feeding the reptilinks something. I, I forgot what I was saying. Um, somebody try to get me back on track. I'll look at comments. Uh, 
We're pretty close to done though because I have to give Lucy a ukulele lesson. And um, let's see. Oh, I bet it was something from. Oh, we were talking about if I'm in a breeder. So yeah, I yes, I probably will. I probably will. Oh, there. Oh, we were talking about the the babies have to be have to be uh, assist fed. So that's why you don't see many black headed pythons. You know, you don't see them in pet shops. You don't see them all the time at, at reptile shows, stuff like that, because they're really hard to get started. And I like that challenge. So um, I think that would be fun for me to do. Uh, um, Eleanor, great question. Reptile links are not good for ball pythons. And it's not that they're not, nutri they're nutritionally great for ball pythons if you can get them to take them. Um, the problem is that it's really hard to get them to, to eat one. I, I got uh, Delilah, who's my freeway. She's eaten a reptile link before. But I did it because she had, she had eaten a very small rat and she was in superfood mode. And I had an extra Reptilink that Echo didn't take. It was probably the first time I tried to feed Echo a Reptilink, and I ended up giving it to Delilah. And she took it, but she's a super food-motivated ball python who had just eaten a small rat and was really looking for something. Um, she took it, coiled it, and dropped it. And then I fed it to her again. I offered it to her again, and she took it and ate it. Uh, I wouldn't normally thaw out a Reptilink with the intention of feeding it to a ball python, though. Really hard to get them to eat those. And then you also don't want them, you know, if you feed them a handful in a row, five, six in a row, and they decide they really like Reptilinks, they may not take rodents again. So uh, the Reptilink website even has a little blurb about that. You know, these are not recommended for ball pythons. It's not because they're not nutritionally great for ball pythons. It's just that they're, you know... The pickiness of ball pythons is uh, difficult sometimes. Uh, yeah, and that's a good point. Not there's not much reason to do rep to links for a ball python when when frozen rats are so cheap. I will say this though, when I give uh, when I give Echo and Stella, what are you doing? Oh, you're in my shirt. She's. She's in my the cuff of my shirt. When I give Stella and Echo a Reptilink, she's just gonna she's just gonna be in there. She's she's digging. Oh jeez, you're flipping yourself over. Imagine she bites you while in your shirt. I don't think she will. I th I think now that she's out, I don't think she'll bite me. Um. Oh, she's back out. Okay. Uh, when I give them a Reptilink, they skip the next week because it's so nutritionally dense that they don't need to be fed the, the week after they eat a reptilink. So usually their diet for, for a super dwarf right now for my super dwarfs, they're going to get um, like a, a mouse, maybe a, maybe a rat pup, you know, or a mouse. And then like yesterday they got two quail. I was going to feed them one button quail each. And then I realized that's way too small for them. So they each got two button quails, which was great because it gave them, both uh they it gave them two target training sessions which was cool so i got a couple button quail uh they'll get um so so week one they'll get a rodent then they'll get a a quail or something uh on week two and then week three they'll get a reptilink and that'll last them through week four and then we start over again so they get fed basically three times a month right now at the size they're at right now um and so reptilinks, my whole point there is reptilinks are about per link, probably twice what a what a what an equally sized rodent is, but you can skip the next week of feeding, so it, it ends up being about the same cost. Um. Oh my gosh, the reptile cult! You're getting a trio of Kimberly Rock monitors. That's amazing. That's going to be really cool. I want to hear about that. It's very exciting. I love monitors, you guys. Um, we're almost done. Oh, now I'm to the point where everybody's saying hi to you. Oh, hi. Everybody's saying hi. Uh, let's see. 
So for those of you who don't know, Lucy is um, Lucy takes care of my snakes when I'm gone for more than three days at a time. She comes in and, and uh, spot cleans and waters my snakes. And she uh, is a ukulele student of mine. She's a very talented musician. Um, and she comes over and her and the, the funny story is her mom her mom usually comes over and is hanging out as well. Uh, and sh her mom is deathly afraid of snakes. So she and Kent are the same level of snake fear, right? And it used to be that her mom would just stand right inside my doorway and wouldn't come in any further. Now, now she'll come in, but we just have to keep snakes about 10 feet away from her. But she's gotten to the point where she's at least okay being in the same room with a snake out. She's just very nervous. Well, she was here when Lucy got, got bit by, by Maya. She was here. And the funny thing was, she so here's what happened. I'm I'm sitting here holding Maya. Lucy wants to hold her, and I go, okay, now just so you know, she might bite you. She's unlikely to, but she might. And as soon as Lucy took her, Lucy's arm smells differently than my arm. And so Maya clamped down and, and Lucy goes, Um, I think she's biting me right now. And and I go, Oh my gosh, is she? And I look, and Lucy goes, Grab the camera, take a picture, take a picture. Right at the same time, her mom's going, Where's the nearest hospital? So, so I was like, look, she doesn't need a hospital. It's going to be fine. So we took a little video and it was fun. And uh, your arm was healed the next day, right? You I had, know. My battle scars went away. I know. They looked cool. You had you had perfect lower and upper teeth marks yes, on your arm. A perfect little indent. Yeah. I little, can't believe that my mom didn't start crying. Little tiny pinpricks. Your mom did so well. It was because you were so calm about it. And, and your mom, so your mom was calm about it. It was great. It was great to for your mom to see a snake bite. This this is probably the worst snake bite you would get out of, out of if anybody here bit you. This would be the worst one. And uh, it was cool to see that. So, um, Lori, thanks for being here. Uh, yes, definitely go talk to your daughter who's in Germany right now. That is uh, more important than sitting here. Uh, I'm glad you're here, though. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish these up and then we gotta and then we gotta end this. Um, yeah, so Eleanor, the um, you're saying you were getting rats from Cold Blooded Cafe, but the shipping and packaging was too much. Yeah, it depends on how much you get. I actually have a dedicated freezer. I've got a small mini freezer that is dedicated, and and I I make it make sense because I'll get a big order um shipped you know i think the shipping is usually th somewhere around 35 dollars, depending on where you get it from but i get a full order and fill the freezer uh each time and i'm i'm ordering every i don't know th maybe three months every two or three th probably three months i'm putting an order in i haven't really figured that out um but yeah rodent pros great I, I buy from them i i lane labs is probably who i buy from mostly just because they're closer to me so they can get you know they can get it shipped faster but if i don't need something immediately because i all of a sudden realize i'm out i'll check the prices of cold-blooded cafe rodent pro lane labs there's another one that's escaping me right now um and uh you know sometimes there's sales or deals or sometimes like cold-blooded cafe doesn't always have um uh other animals like like chicks or whatever but it's good to check them because sometimes they do same with Lane Labs, they sometimes have other things. So if you're if you have other snakes that you're feeding that you'd like to feed a more varied diet, uh, it's good to check those out and see if they've got those things in. Um, okay. I think. Oh come on! I can't move my. All right. Sorry for the sorry for the silence, you guys. Okay. It's 647. We started this at 5. That's probably plenty long enough uh, for a live stream. You guys, thank you so much for being with me, especially those of you who are with me from the very beginning and have sat through this whole thing. I really appreciate it. Uh, next week will be a regular video that is not even done yet, but it'll be up. And um, we're probably going to do end up doing a live stream again in in like a month. So these are always fun. I enjoy chatting with you guys. Thanks for uh, wanting to see Maya because I always like getting her out. And 
I'm surprised she didn't bite me. I thought I was going to walk in front of the camera with her latched onto my arm, and it didn't happen. So, anyway, how do I stop this live stream? Um, oh, don't forget Discord. Check out the Python Green Room on Discord. And, and Patreon if you want to. But go to the Discord. Discord's free. All right. Where is... Stop streaming. I'm doing it now. Bye, you guys. Uh...